Kia ora tātou, kia ora, kia ora, kia ora, no mai, piki mai, kaki mai ki te hui i tēnei wā, and welcome to our webinar this evening, Economics for the People. We organised tonight because we at Action Station think it's absolutely crucial that we talk about the economy as people who experience it every day, whether at the supermarket checkout or through our pay slips. We experience the economy. Once we started asking questions about the cost of living crisis now, how do we talk about it? We realized that actually we need to go back further. As with everything, there is a whakapapa, there is a history. How did we get here in the first place? What do we need to know to make sense of our economy now and in the future? So we have Matt Scobie here, who will be giving us the lowdown about how our economy changed with colonization. We've got Jane Kelsey, who will take us through the 80s and 90s. And we have Max Harris, who will be explaining some of these big concepts that are being used today. Each of them may also share their hopes for what a better economy could look like. Now, our task today is, is a big one. It's to make economics as easy as possible to understand. We have some pretty big brains up in this webinar, and they are here to share what they know, so more of us can know more too. I personally get off, get off and get lost in economic jargon, plus my own sentences, um, but I think nothing changes unless everyday people understand how the economy works and we feel confident to have a say in the decisions that get made about our lives because right now, most of us don't have a say in what we do about inflation, what we do about the cost of living, rather than, say, just saving our power or um, having a better budget. That isn't enough. It's not going to change the situation. So after each of our speakers have their facado or their thoughts, I will follow up with some questions myself to have a little bit of a chat and be like, is there anything that I would be keen to know more about? And then at the very end, we will have a Q&A session for everyone in case you want to know more. It really is a case of no question is a stupid question here. Now is your chance to ask about what these words are that we hear in the news at the moment. At any time, you can put a question in the box on Zoom or on Facebook, and we will do our best to be able to get to them. Before we get started, some housekeeping. Yes, this is a bit of a long webinar, but we wanted to give it the time it deserves. Obviously, no pressure if you have to put the kids to bed or make dinner or what have you. In terms of recording, we will make a call alongside the speakers afterwards on whether we share it with the public. So watch this space, but highly likely it will be up so you can catch the rest of it if you need to. As you can see, we have some amazing sign language interpreters with us. The best way to view them if you need to is by joining Zoom on a computer because we've found that side-by-side -side view won't work on a tablet or a phone. If you're having problems, flick a line to the question box and we will do what we can. Okay, I think it's time to crack into this. First, I think we need some protection from this hectic economy we have. So I'm going to start us off with a karakia. And this one is about exercising our potential, never losing our ancestral knowledge, which I actually think is very important for us to remember on this topic. And Matt will have more on that. So please just take a breath, take a moment to let yourself move from the day that you've just had and into our discussion this evening. Our first speaker tonight is Matt Scobie. Matt is of Kaitahu and Tauiwi descent and is a senior lecturer in the UC Business School at the University of Canterbury. He teaches corporate social responsibility and researches Indigenous development, critical accounting, and Indigenous political economy. Matt, welcome. It's awesome to have you here with us to kick, thing, kick things off. Hand it over to you to start us off. Um, kia ora, Cassie. Um, kia ora koutou katoa. Uh, Heuri he ahau no kaitahu me tauiwi anō. Uh, ko kati hoirapa toku hapu no pukitiraki toku tūpuna. I noho ana au ki o tautahi, um, he kaia ko au ki te whariwananga o waitaha i nai anei, uh, ko Matthew Scobie tāko ingoa, uh, e mihi ana ki a koutou katoa, nō reira tēnā koutou. So thank you so much for the introduction, Cassie. Um, I'm very humbled to be here on this uh, with all these esteemed uh, panellists and that people might want to listen to um, what I have to say. 
Um, so I'll get right on with that. So we can't know how we got here without knowing how capitalism got here. And we can't know how capitalism got here without knowing how colonialism got here because they're all connected. Now, the categories and concepts I'm about to use to explain myself are not what you'd typically hear in an economics degree or textbook. When I learned those things, I found them useful for understanding mainstream perspectives, policy and commentary, but not very useful for knowing how we got here and how we might get out. I needed some other categories and concepts to help me understand that, and I'll be using these categories tonight. So let's start way, way back. Māori had economies. These economies were not capitalist, they were not neoliberal, they were Māori economies. Some things were similar, some things were different. Some things we'd call good now, and some things we'd call bad now. But there were rights, resources, obligations, exchange, labour, wants, needs, goods, services, laws, institutions, governance, etc., Māori had economies. The late Manuka Henare has referred to these as economies of mana, where mana is the basis for sovereignty, but it's also an engine for economic activity because one maintains and enhances their own mana by maintaining and enhancing the mana of others. Mana akitanga, an akitanga. These economies, like all other forms, were not on an inevitable path towards capitalism. They could have developed in a number of ways. Then there was contact, and contact is not equal to colonization. Just like capitalism was not inevitable, colonialism was not inevitable. These early encounters between Māori and newcomers ranged from violent and exploitative to intimate and generative. A lot of bad things happened between contact and titiriti and after that, but some fascinating things happened, and it was a time when Māori began to engage with the global economy on their own terms. These Encounters have been referred to as extractive economies, but also kinship economies, because in many cases, these newcomers had to integrate into Māori communities under the mana of Māori leadership. This often involved intermarriage, and that's where I come from. The marriage between a kaitahu woman named Pōtete and a British whaler named Thomas Ashwell. And while this was all happening, Britain was becoming a terrible place to be. Karl Marx refers to the origin, so how capitalism began in England, as so-called primitive accumulation. For a large group of people willing to sell their time and bodies to others to exist, form of wage labour, required that they be separated from their own subsistence first. Primitive accumulation is a history of blood and fire that contrasts with the economist Adam Smith's story of previous accumulation. Smith basically says, and I checked this tonight, I'm paraphrasing a lot, there are different sorts of workers. Some work really hard, some are lazy. Eventually, the hard workers earn enough to be able to pay the lazy workers to work for them, and the lazy workers are happy to be paid because they're lazy. Um, that's called the uh, division of, uh, of, of labor. Um, and that's how capitalism started, according to Smith. Instead, Marx tracks the enclosures of commons, advancing private property, theft, violence, slavery, debt, etc. This cleared people off rural lands to move into cities, from subsistence economies to where they had to sell their time, earn wages just to survive. So capitalism, in this sense, mediates many aspects of how people make their lives. And what were once opportunities to engage in markets become imperatives just to survive. This surface is one of the many, many tragedies of colonialism that many of the colonizers had their own life ways uprooted by capitalism too. So although capitalism doesn't explain all of colonialism, we shouldn't lose sight of the role of capitalism in colonialism when we talk about colonization and decolonization. Capitalism was not inevitable, but emerged in very specific conditions within England. So, in some primitive accumulation resulted in mass migrations from rural areas to cities, where the majority of people worked for others so they could rent from others and buy food from others. This so-called industrial revolution resulted in a lot of people living and working closely together, becoming gradually more frustrated with their own conditions as those conditions deteriorated and whispering about changing them changing them through their own form of revolution. At the same time, a small class of people became wealthier than they'd ever been, and they needed somewhere to invest that wealth to become more wealthy. This is where Edward Gibbon Wakefield enters. 
So this guy served time in prison for kidnapping a 15-year-old heiress to force marriage upon her. And while doing time, he thought he'd theorize and write about colonization. He also founded the New Zealand Company, or was one of the founders. Now, Wakefield saw colonization as the fix to all of the ills of English capitalism. This is what Rosa Luxemburg forcefully argues, except she suggests it's actually a bad thing, not a good thing, like Wakefield does. Luxembourg argues that primitive accumulation, which I introduced before, was not just the beginning of capitalism, but is actually required for its continued existence. Capitalism always needs an outside to continue its expansion, responding to the growth imperative which drives the system as a whole, and she names this imperialism. So in Wakefield's view, there was a surplus of labor, too many angry workers whispering about revolution. And there was a surplus of capital, too much reckless gambling. He saw colonization as the fix to these surpluses, a place to send workers to quell the revolution, but a source of new resources, new markets, and new profitable investments. But he said, you couldn't just send people away willy-nilly. They might integrate into indigenous communities or create subsistence economies, and that wouldn't serve the interests of capital and empire. No, you had to install the class system there, send crown institutions and send religion. He was very explicit about this. It's, I'm not paraphrasing or I'm not, um, it's not a big secret. He wrote this in a book. You needed colonial capitalism, right? So New Zealand was a fix for English capitalism. The way to do this, according to Wakefield, was to put an artificial price on land to keep it high so that the poor couldn't afford it and would have to work for the rich for wages. And this is the basis for preemption, or it's our basis for preemption, which was a potent form of dispossession built into Te Tiriti or Waitangi. The Crown had exclusive rights to buy and sell Māori land for some time. It did so especially for Kaitahu in the south. It bought low and sold high, helping establish the class system, funding itself, and dispossessing Māori all at once. Māori economies, despite being promised rangatira tanga over whenua, kāinga, and taonga, were dismantled to make way for colonial capitalism. Simon Baba, a Kaitahu scholar, refers to this as tangata being severed from whenua and transformed into labor and property. At the heart of this story is that if New Zealand, the colony, was going to be a fix for ailing English capitalism, then they needed to secure land as property for that capitalism. And New Zealand is still a land-based agrarian economy, and severed whenua still makes up the fundamental basis of this economy. The Crown was acting in the interests of the property class to secure that land, and the Crown continues to be used to secure property at the expense of whenua, capitalism at the expense of any alternatives. So as an example, uh, Catherine Common, who's doing wonderful work on the financial colonization of Aotearoa, points out that prior to the New Zealand Company's Tory, their boat, even landing in New Zealand and negotiating purchase with Māori, Māori land amounting to 110,000 acres had already been sold by the New Zealand Company. It was pure and rampant fraud for speculation. The New Zealand Company ended up heavily indebted, and because there was so much and so many invested, one of the first orders of business for the newly established New Zealand Parliament in 1854 was to authorise the public bailout of the New Zealand Company. Common says, and I quote, it was thus that the founding of the modern nation of New Zealand quite aptly coincided with the settling of its colonial debt. Although the Crown and Wakefield New Zealand Company had been at odds during the 1830s, so the Tories set off in defiance of the Crown, their interests found commonality later. The Crown backing of failed speculative endeavours is by no means a thing of the past, with the South Canterbury finance bailout far exceeding the financial value of any particular treaty settlement. So, moving into the later 19th century, we know that eventually Māori refused to sell whenua, the land was followed, and the native land courts followed that. Māori whenua continued to be transformed into capital for agrarian capitalism. My dear colleague and dear friend Anna Sturman tracks the formation of a dominant small farmer class flowing from these movements of dispossession through the late 19th century. This lay the foundations for how New Zealand's agricultural production for export came to dominate our political economy. This class consolidation ensures that Māori economies remain marginalised and also cements the reliance of nature as the free gift that sustains New Zealand's political economy. 
Anna also argues that the first Labour government came to power in 1935 as a result of broad-based working class struggle and a strategic alliance with small farmers and business against austerity in the wake of the Great Depression. The emergence of New Zealand's first Labour Party and the welfare state that it constructed may be characterised as a passive revolution which stabilised the political economy, with the welfare state taking responsibility for providing the collective necessities of life that capital and capitalism on its own wouldn't. This was to be funded by the ongoing expansion of agricultural exports. So the welfare state in that way didn't challenge capitalist social relations, but actually stabilised them. This provides context for the crisis that emerged in the 1970s and 80s, of which neoliberalism was the next fix. So I've brought us up to the 80s or so, uh, where things took another turn, but we have far more wisdom on this panel to walk you through those times than I. So I'll leave that to my esteemed colleagues. But I would just say that neoliberalism, typically thought of as rolling back the state, rolling out markets and suppressing collective power, for example, of unions, is a continuation of colonial capitalism in this place. Uh, what is neoliberalism if not capitalism persevering? So what does this story that I've told with the help of friends and other inspirations tell us that the key features of this particular political, economic and social system, capitalism, are? Because it's important to distinguish the economy and economies from capitalism. Not all economies and economic activities are capitalist. Uh, so number one, Absolute private property that can be bought and sold. It is no longer whenua, it is property. Number two, a separation between those who own and those who have only their labor or time to sell. Thus, we have a key contradiction between capitalists and workers. Number three, market imperatives, where you have to engage with markets just to survive. Property markets, rental markets, labor markets, food markets, education markets, markets for everything. It's not just an opportunity to engage with the market for something better. You have to to survive. So markets dominate exchange, not manakitanga. Number four, uh, markets lead to coercive competition where people compete each against each other and organizations on markets and do so by lowering costs, especially the costs of labor, as in wages, and the cost of inputs and outputs, cheap or free nature. Number five, an apparent separation between the economic and the political, politics, and an admittedly very narrow version of democracy as representational politics. And this political sphere is siloed off from the economic sphere. We treat them as separate. The economic sphere consists of markets engaging with one another on equal terms with equal opportunities in a political neutral way. But we know that's not really the way it is. It's a political economy. This is in contrast to reciprocal economic, political, and social obligations among Māori, and particularly between leadership and followers. And number six, underlying sovereignty, law, and order, and power coalesces in the capitalist state, and in our case, via the crown, which created and maintains colonial capitalism. Rather than a static institution, it is a set of social relations that is typically wielded by propertyed interests for propertyed interests, but it doesn't have to be. The obligations in Māori economies based on reciprocity, mana, utu, etc., within Māori sovereignty have been moved to the margins but are still profoundly powerful. But none of it has to be this way, and all of this is always contested. So capitalism is backed into the core of this country via colonization, and any attempts at economic change need to take colonialism seriously. Any attempts at decolonization, I think, need to take capitalism seriously too. Alternatives are everywhere when you start looking and imagining. We have seeds of possibility, but these seeds have to be grown and brought to the fore by coalitions of social movements. They won't manifest on their own if they challenge existing power. These alternatives can both stabilize capitalism or prefigure alternatives. What I mean by this um, is that sometimes those alternatives, which aren't formally valued and recognized within capitalism, economics and accounting, are vital to keeping it going. Unpaid care work, organizing around the marae, um, etc. And a lot of these are gendered and racialized. This was a key um, finding of Marilyn Waring, a very influential New Zealand uh, feminist economist. So these can stabilize capitalism by keeping people going because people need things that capitalism doesn't provide because it's not profitable. 
but they are also where alternative possibilities for a brighter future lie. We can prefigure alternatives through these spaces. So scaling them up, scaling them out, so people can better meet their needs and wants beyond markets. And this is also so much more than about ideas and new ways of thinking. Ideas and new ways of thinking are necessary, but not sufficient for economic change. We need these coalitions of social movements, unions, whānau, hapu, iwi, etc., to struggle together to change new ideas and ways of thinking into new forms of organising and ways of doing. So I'd like to go on the record to state that there is plenty to be done in the area of economic change. I think fundamental possibilities for change lie in Māori economies and thinking about Māori economies broadly, uh, and therefore constitutional transformation that takes economic transformation seriously. But there's work to be done here for everyone, not just for Māori. Not all the work needs to be done in the rangatiratanga sphere. Um, there's plenty to be done in the kawanatanga sphere, e.g. through the Crown, to advance economic and constitutional transformation. And there's a lot to be done in the relational sphere where rangatiratanga and kawanatanga meet together for a better future. So thank you so much for letting me speak. Uh, and thank you so much for listening. I'm very humbled to have been given this opportunity. Uh, ngā mahi nui ki a koutou katoa. Kia ora iti tūngani. Thank you. Just going to give a chance to change over the spotlights. As you might have seen, we have to do a bit of manual changing around to put the right person on the screen. So aroha mai whānau if we take a little bit of a lag to get there. Um, but here we are. Thank you, Matt. Um, I have some part eye and I feel like that evil person who's at the front of the class being like, hi, I've got a really hard question. But no question is a stupid question. So I have some for you. And I'll probably aim some of these same ones at Max and Jane just to take the heat off you a little bit. But my first one is the big C's. Okay. Capitalism, colonialism, um, colonization. We've talked about these a lot here, and I think these are the most kind of some of the most important concepts that we need to wrap our head around. Can you please just tell us again, repeat for the ones at the back, um, and another definition of how you would describe capitalism, colonialism, and colonization? Is that too hard? <laughs> Aside from everything you've just shared. Yeah. Um... I mean, the capitalism, those those features were, were fairly fundamental. So absolute private property bought and bought and sold and, and mediated by markets um, is, is fairly essential to capitalism and that separation between those who own and those who labor. Right? So you could think of uh, um, there's a there's a type of thought called diverse economies um, where you imagine an iceberg. Uh, and we know that the majority of icebergs are un underneath um, the surface and above the surface you can see capitalism underneath uh, you know markets wage labor and you know corporate enterprise underneath that you have all these different forms of economic practices um, and that uh, you know care work uh, unpaid care work uh, those things that I mentioned so th that's that's a diverse economy, all those different types of activities, um, but really it's those um, private property, uh, wage labour, markets, uh, and, and kind of formalised enterprise that are, that are key. Um, distinguishing between colonialism and colonisation uh, is an, a, an area of expertise of mine, um, so I don't want to talk too much about that um, because lots of people have thoughts. Uh, I think we need to, and we do take seriously both the disposition of resources, um, of, of uh, Indigenous resources, land, self-determining authority, but also the way that we think, right? So you think of uh, material colonization and the colonization of ideas and knowledge, um, and both of those are essential to, to um, definitions of settler colonialism, um, and this is a settler colony here. Um, and, and both of those are necessary for decolonization as well, thinking differently and uh, different differentiated access to uh, resources based on, in our case, te tiriti and what was promised there. Thank you. Hey, I really love what you brought in there about um, the idea that we have an economy based on markets, not manakitanga. 
And I'm curious if you have any examples of where you've seen Monarchy flourishing in a way that markets do not or should not, or anything that gives you inspiration around monarchy as the basis of an economy. Um, I mean, it's it's kind of like going back to that diverse economies idea again. Um, once you start looking for these things, you find them everywhere. Right. So a lot of organizing around the marae right, which are, you know, keeping the fires of, of Māori, mana, and um, uh, aroha alive, right? A lot of that is outside of markets, right? Um, but those are, those are activities of how we live our lives. They're, they're ways of making lives and livelihoods, uh, mahinga kai, uh, different forms of exchange uh, based on, you know, koha and mana to mana, mana enhancing, sorry, I know people don't like that um, term a lot these days, but but forms of gifting, um, relationships, solidarity, uh, all of those are non-market forms of exchange, uh, not necessarily always the direct exchange of goods, but um, providing, uh, giving our time, sharing our time, uh, sharing some goods. Those are all non-market forms of exchange that are, uh, as I said, really important to uh, help people live better lives. Um, and in some ways they do stabilize things uh, because uh, the a key example right now, I can only do this uh, talk because exactly, almost exactly now, my partner will be putting our 15 month old into the bath. Uh, and, and I couldn't do that without that kind of love and care that she is providing. I couldn't go to work uh, without um, unpaid care work to keep that afloat, right? So it does stabilize. I, I think, uh, I'm not sure if it's Waring or, or later theorists, but referred to care work as a subsidy to capital, right? Um, that wage labor couldn't happen without that uh, social kind of care. But uh, it's also where a lot of beauty and love and um, amazing things that keep us going happen and that could be thought as alternatives if they were scaled up and out um, or a more thorough part of our everyday lives beyond markets. Thank you. I often think of the tangihanga as being an almost kind of microcosm of an economy in itself, right? It's that the, the most important thing is that we look after each other and we look after the whānau pani, the family of the people who have passed. And even though lots of Māori don't have always have heaps to share, it doesn't matter which direction you look, there's an uncle dropping off a whole bunch of meat to put in the chiller, there's people bringing the potatoes, there's people who are bringing the taonga out that they've been looking after for years, and we just see everyone come together and everything works, everything works at a tangihanga for the most part, and I, I think it always inspires me to be able to see, hey, we can have a way of operating in economies that don't look like exploitation and things like that, so um, yeah, hey, thank you, Matt. I have more questions, but I'm not going to put you on the spot because I reckon that um, we can do more of that later. But this has been really wonderful. And I'm going to move us to our next speaker, who is Jane Kelsey. So many of you have probably heard of Jane. She's one of New Zealand's most acute social commentators. For several decades, her work has centered on the interface between globalization and domestic neoliberalism with particular reference to free trade and investment agreements. Uh, I, I don't actually think there's any end to the incredible contribution Jane has made on all kinds of kaupapa and we're really stoked to have us here tonight. So Jane, over to you. Oh, kia ora. I've just been showing how technologically bad I am because my phone has done weird things. Uh, kia ora koutou, he mihi mana, kia koutou. Um, I am a retired academic activist um, and am very pleased to be able to come and share some thoughts with you. Um, it's kind of speaking into a void here, so it's really hard to know 
what the audience is. So I'm going to try to speak more to those who haven't lived through what I'm going to talk about. Um, one of the things that happens when you become a pensioner is that the things that you, that you lived through that are part of the reality of your life to next generations are history. And so I'm going to talk about things that happened around 40 years ago. Um, some of you may not have been born then. And some of you may have been uh, uh, around with, with me and others. Um, but I think it's a really important challenge to the kind of questions that are behind um, today's wānanga that we need to have intergenerational learning. And for those of us who understand what happened in our time, it's a very difficult challenge to work out how to make it meaningful to the generations who are dealing with the legacies of that today. And one of the things I really liked um, uh, a few years ago was that Bridget Williams books, and she was my wonderful publisher for, for many years, um, published one of her little books um, written by Andrew Deans, who was a student trying to make sense of the world that he was living in and his generation about a decade ago. And who was responsible for that? And the book was called Ruth, Roger and Me. And you'll find out why it's called that shortly. Um, but he had decided that to understand just as with this wānanga, the, um, the foundation stones that would have to be dismantled to make structural change, he needed to go back and understand those formative years. So he tracked it back to period that began in 84, um, period that we knew at the time as Rogernomics because it was named after Roger Douglas, who was the, the key political architect of the time, uh, succeeded by what was then known as Ruthanasia uh, in the early 1990s, uh, named after Ruth Richardson, uh, who was the finance minister then, and, and followed a little bit after that by what was called genocide, uh, which was named after Jenny Shipley, uh, who uh, took over from Ruth as, as the architect. This was basically a period from 84 through to 96. And that changed the world as we had known it in Aotearoa. It was not unique to here. There were parallel developments that occurred, again, attributed to key revolutionary leaders, um, General Pinochet in Chile, Ronald Reagan in the US, Margaret Thatcher in the UK. And, and one of the difficulties that we had at the time when people were trying to understand what was actually going on in this global revolution was how to move from holding the individual architects to account, as we did with the names like Rogernomics and Ruthanasia and Thatcherism and so on, to understanding the systemic drivers that were behind this kind of revolution. And it's a similar kind of challenge for rangatahi today, 
I mean, the kinds of challenges that there are about social injustice, about the legacies of colonization, about the collapsing health system and the housing crisis and racism and the, uh, and the climate emergency. We can put corporate names to them. We can put even some people's names to them, but we have to understand the underlying systems. So I want to talk um, a, a bit about that, but at the same time, I want to talk about the politics of how this happened. Because if we're going to look at transformation from this period, which we refer to as neoliberalism, to a post-neoliberal era, we have to understand the kind of strategic challenges that are involved, as well as what has been embedded systemically that needs to be disembedded to move into a different space. So the period post-1984 is sometimes described as a revolution. I described it in the, in the book I wrote about it as the New Zealand experiment. Because in many ways, what happened in this country went further and faster than in most other countries except for Chile. And in fact, The Economist magazine at one stage called Aotearoa Chile without the gun. So we were like what happened in General Pinochet's Chile, but it was done under a so-called democratic system and process. Now, what, the, the story is a bit like a conspiracy theory. So I'm, I'm very well aware that we are in an era of conspiracy theories and rabbit holes. And this is not a rabbit hole. This is actually a genuine conspiracy of very clever, strategically located, Carter of bureaucrats, mainly economists, I'm sorry, Matt, I know you're not one of that ilk, of very rich businessmen, and they were almost all businessmen, and of politicians who managed to body snatch the Labour Party, and who moved at a time incredibly successfully having developed a blueprint that they set about putting in place. And part of the way they were able to do that was that there was turmoil in the country. This was a time of, of extensive Maori activism, right? It was a time that we were having occupations. It was a time when Takaparafa, for example, which we have the, the anniversary of um, this week, uh, had occurred. There was lots of, of Maori mobilization. Uh, we'd had Te Matakite, the, the land march. We'd had calls for uh, a shift away from the kind of, of um, state-controlled, welfareist economy that there was at the time. There was lots of union activism. We had things like the um, Mangere Bridge strike and, and a variety of um, very important uh, developments. We actually had full employment at the time. Uh, we had a progressive movement on foreign policy. So we had lots of anti-apartheid activism. We had the nuclear free and independent Pacific movements. And so there was lots of support for the Labour Party to take over from Muldoon, who was the autocratic, anti-unionist, racist, um, but very hands-on economist who people wanted to get rid of. And one of the important lessons I would like people to take away from this is that there was a high level of economic illiteracy. And so people thought a new Labour government would bring in progressive changes. 
But whilst people were focused on the social and the treaty and the foreign policies, they weren't focused on what the economic agenda was going to be. And that economic agenda um, was ruthlessly implemented through what was known as a blitzkrieg strategy of moving as fast as possible on as many fronts as possible. So while people were trying to understand and catch up, uh, they were moving on to the next phase of it. It was a process known as kamikaze politics. And you'll note there's lots of militarist language here, uh, which was they didn't care if Labour didn't get re-elected. The objective was actually to put this in place, a new form of capitalism that was backed by a form of market liberalism that harnessed the ideologies that were being developed offshore and which celebrated wealth and success in particular, through making money out of money. So the old economy had been either an agricultural economy or to some extent an industrial economy that was a, a small manufacturing economy, but where you actually made things. The purpose of the neoliberal economy was much more what we called stakeholder capital, uh, shareholder capitalism. It was companies whose purpose was to make money for its shareholders. And they didn't care how they did that. And that meant often being very ruthless in the way that they went about running their operations. It meant about being highly exploitive in the labor markets that they operated. It meant being very short-term thinking about the exploitation of natural resources. It meant um, having no social conscience. And so this particular model was what was systematically put in place, especially over that 12 year period. And during that time, there was an ideology behind it that celebrated the success of wealth creation as being entrepreneurial, as being uh, innovative, as being the kind of aspiration that New Zealand should have for its future economy. And to celebrate and encourage them, you needed to remove regulatory fetters on their ability to operate. You needed to lower taxes so that they were to able to enjoy their just rewards and reinvest their wealth in creating more wealth. It was a, a time when the government had to get smaller, had to shrink. And not only did these key players become the architects, they became the beneficiaries of this process. So Bruce Jesson, a, a wonderful journalist um, uh, who sadly um, died much too young, wrote this wonderful book called only their purpose is mad, how the money men take over New Zealand. And he showed how this transition was able to take place in such a small country, supported by think tanks that were funded by the same players. The Business Roundtable, for example, whose successor now uh, is the New Zealand Initiative. And they acted as the external cheerleaders. In the meantime, the Blitzkrieg strategy meant that most of those who were critics were being burnt off. They were struggling. The, the media, the National Business Review started publishing daily. It became such a, a success story. And in universities, 
economic history stopped being taught. You started to have uh, only this new exciting model being generated. And so the ideological framework that took over assumed that we needed to have a successful economy, not based on a society, but based on individualism, of liberating individuals to be able to maximize their potential, of people interacting through markets, housing markets where you had landlords and tenants who would negotiate on a level playing field, workers and employers who would negotiate employment contracts on a level playing field, um, and, and where you would have buyers and sellers negotiating outcomes that were win-wins that had no systemic inequalities of the capitalist economy. And of course, Māori who were intrinsically, as Matt has described, in the class structures, but also in the, the processes of dispossession at the lowest tiers in that economy. And so unions were systematically destroyed, universities were made into um, institutions that competed with each other, who had customers, who paid fees, um, you had uh, notions of the public good disappearing. You had welfare benefits being cut back because that meant that you didn't have incentives for people to go out and find jobs. You had minimum wages being removed, the youth wage being removed. You had... Um, uh, in 1991, the mother of all budgets, $1.3 billion cut from welfare benefits. You had state-owned enterprises first made into um, profit-making entities in which the government were the shareholders, but where their purposes, whether it was telecoms or electricity or railways, or post services or, or the post office bank, all of their objectives were primarily to turn a profit that was a dividend to government. And what that did was make them slim out the state entities, shed labor, stop unprofitable activities. That meant they were ready to be privatized. And who were the advisors on the privatizations? our same friends who we've seen before. Who bought them? Our same friends who we've seen before. So it was corrupt, but you weren't allowed to use the word corruption because the Transparency International Index said we didn't have corruption here. It was systemic. It wasn't kind of into individual bribery. And then, of course, over time, we saw that the market failed. We even had to buy back Air New Zealand. We had to buy back the railways. We had to start Kiwi Bank because the foreign-owned private banks didn't want to serve poor people. We saw the privatized forestry sector being... Um, sold off on Māori land, so Māori kept the land, but they couldn't actually control the forests. And so the incentive for the forest owners was to cut health and safety, was to leave the slash, and was to take no responsibility. But we even saw the market model in treaty settlements. We saw that it, treaty settlements were giving a lump of money to iwi to go and buy back their own whenua at market rates, operated through a corporate structure that the Crown approved of. So what we had there is a, a systematic dismantling right, and a transfer of money and power. The last part of the picture I want to talk about 
is the least visible part and for me the most insidious part. So I wrote a, a book a few years ago now called The Fire Economy, which is an economy based on finance, insurance and real estate. How do you make money in Aotearoa these days? It's in the finance sector, the insurance sector, and buying and selling property. We don't invest in anything real anymore. And that was underpinned by a really important set of laws and, and regulatory processes that are deeply embedded in the state. So one of those laws, the Fiscal Responsibility Act, that sits as a norm that you have low public debt, which means you have lots of private debt because the debt ends up being transferred across to, to households. You have um, either budget surpluses or very low budget deficits, like we saw in the, in the recent um, budget. We have uh, a notion that it's irresponsible to borrow and, and to invest to build for the future. We have an assumption in there of a low tax regime. And who benefits from low tax? Those with money. Second was the State Owned Enterprise Act that allowed what I described before with the corporatization and privatization of state activities. We had the State Sector Act that meant that the public service was now run on the basis of contracts and of high paid chief executives who had to deliver on key performance indicators. We had the Reserve Bank Act, which again we've seen in play now, who, which was set up to be independent from government, so government couldn't influence it. But we also had as its sole objective to control inflation. And how did it control inflation? Like we've seen now, it raised interest rates, it induced recessions, it led to laying off people that suppressed expenditure that brought inflation down. And so why was inflation so important? Not because of the cost of living for ordinary people, but because it erodes the value of wealth. And so Reserve Bank Act now still has that as a objective, um, but the, the current government introduced supporting maximum sustainable employment as well, which is a real tension. Public Finance Act, government funds activities of the state through contracts. It can only fund what there is a funded outcome for which is a way of them controlling, saying, no, no, we can't fund that because it's not part of what's been budgeted. Best practice regulation, the presumption that there will be light-handed or self-regulation, not a nanny state. That's what brought us Pike River. It's what brought us a slash in the forests. It's what's brought us the crises in the... Um, uh, in the retirement villages and rest homes. It's what's brought us uh, all sorts of problems of light-handed regulation. All of that is deeply embedded as the norm in how government operates. And it's all locked in through my favorite instruments, the free trade agreements, which are not really anything to do with trade. Most of the chapters, 30 chapters in the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, only about six of them dealt with commodity trade. They dealt with intellectual property rights, investment, um, control of services, best practice regulation, et cetera. So let me bring to the, this to a conclusion. We are now seeing in Aotearoa and internationally the legacy and consequences of this failed model. And for a short period of time, it was exciting and looked like we might have a transformation, especially after the global financial crisis 
uh, in 2009. And we had in the US, Bernie Sanders. We had Corbyn in the UK, and, and our next speaker can talk about that. We had suggestions here that we might even have some significant change. But in fact, what we had was a restabilization of the neoliberal model. We had a little bit of, of inclusiveness on the, um, on the margins, but capital has reestablished itself with a vengeance. And so what we see now is the same control over the agenda of political parties where neither of them is prepared to rock the boat or be seen to break those norms that have been established over the last 40 years. Colonial capitalism continues to prevail. Māori economy that is so celebrated is a Māori capitalist economy. It's not the kind of economy Matt was talking about. And we have the climate crisis where, as we see with New Zealand Steel, the answer is that we bail out the, the biggest um, uh, polluters um, so that they um, can lower their emissions. Uh, and then we have Fonterra now lining up to say, oh, please do it for us too. In this process, we have disempowered the population. We have disempowered Māori. We have uh, replaced it with an MMP system that is totally dependent on a political party structure. So what do we need to do? We need to activate, activate again. The way we've made change in the past is by people mobilising. But people need to mobilize not just around day-to-day -day realities. It needs to be supported by knowledge about what transformation means, whether that's Matike Mai and, and treaty-based transformation, whether it's um, rewriting the way that capitalism operates in a degrowth agenda, when it, whether it's about um, counteracting the international trade agreements and investment agreements um, to pro progressively dismantle those. And most importantly, whether it is about developing a counter agenda of how to disembed those norms and have a different structure of the state that can achieve and support the transformation that people need. Kia ora koutou. Kia ora. Jane. Wowzers, I don't even know where to start because I felt like you traverse a lot there. And as somebody who was born in 1989, so after the 1984 changes and before the 1991 changes, you know, our generation, I often say this, our generation don't actually know anything about what life looked like before 1984. Like we have only ever lived in the most accelerated form of neoliberal capitalism that we exhibit now. This is normal to us. And bless, bless their souls, the Zoomers, sorry, that's what I call them, but the Generation Z, I think, the ones coming in, um, after us, it's even more hectic. It's it, there's even less that um, that they experience and that they have entitled to. So, so this is why it's so important for us to be able to hear the history of what has been. Um, and again, you went through a lot of things, and I kind of feel like every question I have feels really kind of pithy and small compared <laughs> to the bigness and gravity of what you shared just now. Um, but I do want to, you, you commented on something and I just want to pull it out, seems small, but it's actually important. Um, our right wing parties love to talk about how um, tax is better in our back pockets or whatever they say. Um, you made a comment here about how rich people benefit from low tax. And can you just explain a little bit more about how that works while we're hearing all this talk about tax relief and tax cuts and so on? Uh, kia ora, yes. Um, 
Milton Friedman, um, and in fact, the ACT Party today, um, and Milton Friedman was a guru of, um, uh, of the neoliberal era, uh, even though he preceded it, um, described tax as theft. The state taking people's money and using it in ways that those who made it and earned it have no control over to the benefit of others. So if they want to do charity, fine. But the state should not be taking their wealth and forcibly distributing it to others. Now, that's very much based on this notion of individualism. Right? Each individual is responsible for themselves. And so when I started working at the university in 1979, the top tax rate um, that I paid, and I wasn't amongst the top earners as a little lecturer, um, was 60 cents in the dollar. And that was part of what made a welfare state, which had its problems. Um, I'm not pretending that was nirvana, um, but it's what meant that the levels of inequality were actually less, that you had free education, that you had a health system that, that functioned um, and so on. And you had subsidized utilities and, and the like. So one of the very first things that they did post 84 was to lower the top income tax rate. And that meant, of course, the state had less money, so it had to cut back what it did. And the notion was that if people had money, if rich people had money, then they would reinvest it in the economy and that would make things grow and that would be great. Well, in fact, they didn't. They bought yachts and they had expensive meals. And I remember one where they, in the days before plastic money, they lit cigars with $10 notes and so on. Um, so it was, it was obscene wealth. Um, but then they introduced GST to make up some of that tax uh, shortfall. But at the same time as they reduced the progressive tax rate so that rich people paid less, GST was on everything for everyone. So poor people paid a larger share of the tax. So you had a two-way distribution. And then, of course, that's before you have all the trusts and so on that became part of, of how you avoided tax. And the property boom, because we are about the only country, maybe the only country in the OECD that doesn't have a capital gains tax. So if you want to make money out of your money, you do it through property. So the, there was a kind of integrated agenda there that shifted the tax burden from the rich to the poor at the same time as forcing cuts back in the state so that the state wasn't doing stuff and the private sector was, or they had to privatize to get money to repay debt that they weren't able to um, pay off with, um, with revenue or had to raise debt to deal with the, um, with the deficit. Sorry, that was a long answer, but it may, it may kind of help explain some of the things you see today. Thank you, Jane. And I think Max will give us more on tax in a hot second. So that's really helpful because it adds in that history. And I've got two questions from the audience to you specifically, Jane, and I just want you to have a chance to respond to them. Okay. So the first one says, somebody says, I agree with you, but don't you consider the extreme neoliberalism that took place in New Zealand to mostly be a reaction to the utter failure, to Muldoon's wage and price freeze, which almost destroyed the New Zealand economy? First question. Second question, kia ora Jane, awesome info. I felt like the employment contracts bill was a huge thing in my life. And after that, we in the precariat, sorry, I don't know how to say that word, and nobody pulled together anymore. Can you comment? 
You can catch those. Uh, kia ora, yes. Well, let me, let me take the, the employment contracts at one first. Um, this was the most radical deregulation of the labour market happened in 1991 uh, there, uh, other than in Chile. Uh, so the new law that was introduced, and this was a real experiment um, for OECD countries, uh, took the word union out of legislation. Um, unions weren't allowed into workplaces. There was a presumption that everyone was employed on an individual contract. Um, again, in a level playing field of the employment market. Um, that built on, in fact, the, the Labour government, 84 to 90 Labour government, which itself undermined many of the unions, but the unions were also problematic. Yeah? And the unions had got quite lazy because of compulsory unionism. And so they went from compulsory unionism to this radical deregulation of the labor market. And there were some unions, CTU was terrible, didn't actually voted against having a general strike when the Employment Contracts Act came in. The Trade Union Federation was set up to be an activist trade union base. Um, and, and so the legacy that we've got now especially in small workplaces, and that's especially women's workplaces, um, is a highly de-unionized workforce, except in the state sector, which because of the structure of the state sector was still able to, and the teachers um, and, and nurses were able to retain reasonably high unionization. So that that has a, a lasting legacy and, and it's really difficult to come back from where that was despite unions trying to. Much shorter answer to the Muldoon. Uh, Muldoon's wage and price freeze was a, a symptom. It was a, um, a short-term measure that was dealing with the stagnation of the particular form of capitalism that was operating in that um, period from the post-war era through to the late 70s. And those of us who are critics of neoliberalism are very clear that things had to change. The question was, was that the only model? And part of the difficulty and the difficulty that we face now in, in undoing what there is now is that there wasn't a vibrant debate about economic alternatives. And that was the key. And that is what enabled the Treasury and its 1984 briefing papers and Roger Douglas, who, with some help from a couple of people in the and the Reserve Bank orchestrated a crisis that meant that they had to step in immediately and take measures that they could never have done under an ordinary democratic process. And so I think we need to see the end of Muldoonism um, as a part of that, um, uh, the, what Gramsci refers to as an interregnum. The old is dying, the new is yet to be born, um, we don't know what it will look like. Unfortunately, the bad guys got in. Jane, I'm aware there's actually quite a few questions. Oh, Aroha mai, I'll re-spotlight. There's quite a few questions for you and many points. So Aroha mai whanau for people who have more questions for Jane, but hang around because we'll, we'll have another Q&A at the end. And we'll take a look what we've got then. Um, but I do want to um, get us through to Max because I, I feel like um, I will go deep into Jane's court at all. And I don't want to forget about Max because Max is important and I think he can pick up on, on where we've left off, left off. But Jane, thank you. I Yeah, I just think that you speak with such clarity around a lot of these things that we're just not doing at the moment. And there's so many points in there. Like I just want to pull out so many points and be like this 
this is important, this is important. And what I heard from that is that we actually need to get activated on economic issues. We need to re-spark the debate around our economy. And it only serves the people who are in positions of power and wealth if the majority of us don't weigh in on the debate and build power to be able to create an economy that works for us better. That's what I'm loosely paraphrasing from what I heard here. And that's that's awesome. Let's do that. Okay, Fana, we just got to do that. We've got it all cut out for us. I'm going to take us over to Max. I'm not going to make any more jokes about Max running with tax. It's so hard for me. But I want to um, pick up on, I guess, some of the next generation talk, really. So um, if you haven't heard of Max, he's a campaigner action station, but he also works as a barista or a lawyer at Thorndham Chambers. He's on several ongoing research and campaign projects. He's pretty active on Twitter. He's worked as an economic policy advisor in academia and in other policy roles. Max, tell us what you know about the economy. And before you do that, I'm going to work out how to share my screen <laughs> so you have a PowerPoint. One moment, please, callers. It's definitely not it. That's my hapu, if you can see them. Okay. How's that? Round three. Over to you, Max. Kia ora, Cassie. Thanks so much. Nami hinui ki a koutou. Tēnā tātou katoa. Ko wai o he pāke a hou. E tamaki makoto a hou e noho ana e mahi ana. Ko Max Harris toku ingoa. Um, yeah, I, like Cassie, just really enjoyed um, listening to Matt and Jane and was furiously writing down notes um, as they were speaking. And I think what they both did was, um, I suppose, arm us with stories and concepts that we can follow up on, um, that we can use in arguments and in our movements, and that hopefully can give us more confidence and power in trying to build the uh, integrated counter agenda that Jane was talking about. Um, and hopefully I'll um, I'll add to that. Um, what I want to do is um, split my talk into three parts. And um, if it's okay, Cassie, um, just jump to the next slide. Um, so first of all, I'm just going to talk about um, my background and a little bit about some work I did in economic policy and I guess how I um, became excited about economics, but also um, the blind spots and limitations that I have. Um, Secondly, um, what I want to do is sketch out and demystify three um, contemporary debates that are couched in traditional economic language around debt and tax and inflation. And I guess I want to drop us, drop us into that world of traditional economic thinking, live in that world for a moment, talk about some of the arguments um, back and forth within that world um, so that we can take some of those arguments on. Um, and then in the third part of my talk, um, I want to uh, step out of that world, I guess, and um, consider some foundational ideas that represent a different approach to economics that could be, if presented in the right way, building blocks towards a different kind of economy. Um, and I just wanted to shout out uh, to Cassie, both for, for helping out with my slides and for with Ella Grace um, having the inspiration to, to set up this event tonight. And I think we had like an amazing response of more than a thousand people um, registering, which speaks to the, the public appetite for, for more accessible conversations. I also want to shout out to, to Matt and to Jane. Um, I think um, Jane taught me, um, Matt helped me through my PhD. Um, they're both amazing thinkers as well as really lovely supportive people. Um, but yeah, just to come to a bit about kind of where I come from on this, um, I had a longer section on my background that um, I've decided just to shorten, um, just to get more quickly to some of the ideas. But I suppose some of the key points just to pull out here are um, that uh, I was lucky growing up uh, uh, that I had um, some books around me um, growing up. My parents weren't um, inclined to business and economics. My dad has background in journalism and development, my mum in nursing and public health. Um, I uh, did a little bit of um, study of economics in undergrad, but only quite a little. Um, I did kind of struggle with maths a little bit uh, at school but and, and worked hard at it. Um, so yeah, I'm not someone who um, for whom say like economics and maths necessarily came easy, even though I, I feel like I've had various advantages. Um, and I guess what I would say 
is that I, I started um, kind of reading more about economics, um, yeah, going through uni um, after studying a master's of public policy. Um, and what I can remember are, are several moments um, when I began to get more excited about what economics could be. Um, and for me, economics is just about um, how we make and share resources. Um, we can we can come up with different definitions, and I might come back to that. But that's broadly um, the definition I'll I'll go with. Um, so one one moment was um, uh, when I was studying in the UK, going to hear um, Mariana Matsukato speak. Um, that's the person at the bottom of that slide. She's an economist who's written um, a number of books. And she was speaking at a, um, a weekend conference, I think it was a conference called the Festival of Dangerous Ideas, about the state and the role of the state in innovation. And there are some things that I don't agree with uh, Mariana Mazzucato on. Um, she's someone that wants to, to fix and, and rescue capitalism, and I, I have a different perspective on that, but it was a really exciting talk because it centered the role of the state, what the state could do, what the state has done historically, and it was a different perspective that made me think of economics in a different way. And then secondly, um, uh, while I was in the UK, I, um, I was lucky to be funded to do a PhD in law. And so a lot of my, my study has been in law and politics, and that probably shapes how I come at some of these issues. Um, but, but during this period, um, the Corbyn project took off in the UK, and Jane mentioned this. And this was when John, uh, uh, Jeremy Corbyn unexpectedly became leader of, of the Labour Party um, with a radical programme. And... Uh, the economic program that he and a number of others began to set out uh, was different to how I'd heard economic policy talked about. Um, there was a commitment to uh, workers and trade unions. Um, there was a commitment to internationalism. There was a commitment to public ownership of rail, mail, water, and energy. There was talk of a financial transactions tax, of more progressive taxation. These are things I'll, I'll come back to, some of these things later in the talk. But it was it was quite a thrilling time when um, suddenly a different approach on the economy was becoming mainstreamed, and at this time I um, felt excited. There were uh, regular events um, like an annual event called the World Transformed, um, and I uh, ended up getting a job uh, working on some papers uh, that were feeding into the Corbyn project and. Um, then managed to get a job um, in John McDonnell's office. And that's the person at the top of that slide there. And John McDonnell was the shadow chancellor under Jeremy Corbyn. And um, I won't go all, into all of the detail, but um, the job was as an economic policy advisor. I didn't have hugely deep experience in economics um, and sat a Microsoft Excel test as part of my interview that I really bombed and um, felt like I wasn't gonna get this job, but in the end I got this job and um, uh, was really lucky to work with a number of people who helped um, me learn and upskill in my economic knowledge, but also showed me that um, you can do economics from lots of different backgrounds. Um, and uh, yeah, I also saw people um, with confidence in economics who hadn't necessarily studied it, including um, from John McDonnell. But um, I helped to work on this really exciting program. I helped to work on uh, policy around a financial transactions tax, around public ownership of broadband, um, around uh, tax avoidance, a national investment bank, uh, and a number of other areas. And um, yeah, I just mentioned this because um, it explains how I got excited and it also explains this idea of kind of alternative economic possibilities. Um, and I guess this is connected to um, a theme that I really want to underscore in everything I say, which is that um, often when we talk about the economy, it's presented as uh, something separate and something distinct. And um, Matt has touched on this as well. Um, but one thing that's been emphasized by a lot of great writers like Alan Mikeson's Wood and others is that um, that's actually something that's come out of capitalism, seeing the economy as separate. And the economy is actually something that we build as, a, as, a, as humans, that we have built as humans, um, and that is built politically. So we decide on the rules that govern markets. We even decide when to create markets, when to close markets down, when to shut markets. These are all human-made things and, and, um, and, and things that involve political judgment. Um, and they're also things that we can remake as, as humans. And connected to this point, which is something that I'm gonna come back to, is the point that in my view, and from the work that I've done, economics is something much 
closer to politics than it is to something like physics. Often it's presented as something that's scientific um, and what and how I understand um, economics um, is, is um, as something that involves value judgments, that involves politics. And that means that we can all be involved in conversations about economics and political economy. And just to break down that term, political economy, um, I was working with a community politi a political education group um, that described political economy as just being about power and money, or power and money or, re or resources. And we can all talk about power and money or resources. We all have um, experiences of that. Um, and if we can all participate in economic conversations, um, I think we can build a better economics. I think um, we can build an economics for the people that isn't so focused on um, economic policy that serves uh, the few rather than the many. So that's a point I'm going to come back to, um, that we can all participate in economics, that economics is political, we should think about political economy, and that that will help us to build an economics for the people. So that's a bit about where I come from and how I come at these issues. Um, I want to go into that second part now uh, and drop into some of these contemporary debates. I should say that, unfortunately, the Corbyn project wasn't successful on one level. So um, Jeremy Corbyn lost um, the 2017 and 19 elections. But um, I think that project has shifted the debate um, in the UK, um, just as um, uh, debates have shifted in, in many places. And I should say as well, relevant to that, that um, my feeling is that um, I've sort of become more radical over time in my thinking, partly because I think maybe many on the call that the times have radicalized us. And I, I think that going, th living through, uh, while we might not have lived through um, uh, Rogenomics and Ruth and Asia, um, that living through the global financial crisis, living through multiple crises in our lives, noticing that um, problems that we come up against are actually structural, um, that debates kind of swing back um, that that um, can't but make us, I think, more radical in our thinking, at least that's been the case for me. But to get to some of the current debates and um, traditional economic thinking, um, Cassie asked me to touch on um, tax and also several other concepts that swirl around um, in mainstream economic debates. And what I sh um, should say here is that I'm, I'm going to talk about debt and tax and inflation briefly. And each of these concepts has its own history and each of these ideas uh, have, has meant different things at different points in history, um, but I guess I'm going to talk about how they arise in New Zealand debates um, right now. Um, so to begin with debt, we're seeing a lot of scaremongering about public debt at the moment. Um, this is actually what um, happened in the UK when I moved to the UK in the early 2010s, and what followed that was a, a, a massive program of devastating cuts. But what we're seeing, um, as, as you can see in these slides, is uh, claims that Auckland Council is at risk of blowing out its debt as it considers its current budget. Um, bogus claims, in my view, and I can say more about that. And we've seen criticisms that central government debt is now uh, eye-watering. Um, and so you can see that just in the little bit I've, I've taken out from that um, Kate Hawksby article, which is the second little bit of text in the, in the slide. So public debt uh, is just the total stock of what the government has borrowed. You'll often hear about um, deficits and debt Deficits are um, when a government uh, uh, spends more than what it receives in income from year to year, but debt is the total amount, it's a stock of what the government has borrowed. Public debt is often measured as a percentage of GDP, gross domestic product, to just the total output of the economy or the total amount consumed. And unlike private debt, public debt is not owed to, to one lender or, or even normally a small number of lenders, it's owed to very many people. It doesn't have to be paid off in the same way as private debt. I mean, quite often government debt is owed to government itself. Um, so the New Zealand government um, owns uh, owes a lot of debt to the to the Reserve Bank, that central bank that um, Jane already talked about. And the way it works is government borrows by selling bonds to investors, um, and uh, government pays an interest rate on those bonds, and the bonds have a date by which they have to be paid back. Um, at the end of 2020, just to give you a picture, about 50% of government debt in New Zealand was owed to people overseas and 50% to people in New Zealand. And I guess, yeah, what I want to just touch on here is like the function of debt in conversations. So um, uh, often debt is raised um, as a way to discourage governments from spending and investing. 
But here's the thing, there's actually no magic number when public debt becomes dangerous. And this comes to the, the picture at the bottom of the slide there. So there were two uh, conservative economists, Reinhardt and Rogoff, who tried to claim that when government debt hits 90% of GDP, um, growth is discouraged. And that's the kind of magic bad number. And that interestingly um, was found to have been based on a coding error and kind of basic mathematical error. And as Jane pointed out, a strong feature of neoliberal capitalism has been the imposition of debt caps. Um, so limits on um, government spending, on government borrowing. Uh, New Zealand's adopted a, a cap of 30% um, uh, debt to GDP um, using a kind of revised measure. Auckland Council's used um, debt to income measures of uh, variously 290% of income, 270% of income in recent years. You might've seen debates about the US debt ceiling at the moment. Um, and I guess the really insidious thing, as Jane pointed out, is that um, uh, these caps and these limits have also been entrenched through legislation, um, through things like the Public Finance Act, which requires prudent debt. Um, and I guess uh, I could go on and, talk and, and say a lot more about this, but, but my core point is, is the sky would not fall in if these caps were exceeded. Um, we've got very low government debt at the moment in New Zealand, 18% of GDP compared to 98% of GDP in the UK, 100% of GDP in the US. Some of the concerns that come up are often that credit rating agencies will downgrade our government's credit rating. Credit rating agencies are private, undemocratic bodies, but New Zealand's credit rating is, is very strong and agencies just require a, a sound plan to be assured that finances are in a good position. Another concern that often comes up is, is about servicing the debt, so the, the cost of interest rates. Um, that's not a problem. Uh, it's not a fatal worry in New Zealand at the moment. And I guess my core point here is we need to be really careful about panicking about debt. Um, and being literate about this, as, as Jane pointed out, can help us uh, not be bamboozled by um, economics or supposed experts with an agenda. I should say that there's a field of economics called modern monetary theory, which says there is uh, kind of no limit on government debt. And I'm not a subscriber to that field of, of economics, but I do think borrowing is one important way to invest. And I think we need to be more confident about it and find um, increasingly better ways to talk about it. I'm just to move to the next slide, and I'm going to kind of boost through quite quickly. Um, another current area of debate that many people will be familiar with is um, around tax. And um, many of you will have seen this IRD report that's come out recently um, uh, talking about um, the low rates of um, average tax paid um, by uh, the 311 wealthiest New Zealand families. Um, there have been lots of different debates over time, as Jane and Matt have pointed out, around taxation. Matt's also doing some really interesting work on uh, Maori taxation um, uh, prior to colonization and, and um, during contact. Um, but a key concept here is progressive taxation, something that Jane alluded to, the notion that um, the tax rate should increase as taxable income increases. And Jane essentially made the point that New Zealand's tax system has become less progressive over time. And, and I won't repeat what Jane said, but prior to 84, New Zealand's top income tax rate was, was 66%. We had an inheritance tax that was abolished in 93 a stamp duty on property purchases abolished in 99. As Jane pointed out, GST introduced in 86, initially at 10%, now 15% as a much more regressive tax. Also, um, financial services are exempt from GST, a point that's not often um, kind of made in public debate. And as Jane said, we have no capital gains tax, no financial transactions tax. And just to compare us to the UK, um, I don't think the UK is a model for very much at the moment, but the UK does have inheritance tax with lots of loopholes, stamp duty, which applies to some financial transactions, um, and a, a tax on capital. So a key debate this year, I think, is um, should New Zealand's tax system become more progressive? And this could be done by cutting tax rates at the bottom, for example, creating a tax-free zone or abolishing GST or um, ex exempting GST from fruit and vegetables, or altering the tax brackets or imposing higher rates of income tax at the top end. Another debate is whether corporate profits should be taxed at a higher rate for a windfall profits tax, that's a one-off tax on excess profits, um, or increasing company tax, since company tax only applies to profits. Um, I think an important battleground, as Jane alluded to, is not just building a movement for tax, but also um, working on how we communicate about tax. So we don't speak of tax as theft, as Jane pointed out, or tax as burden or relief, um, but as something more like um, a contribution to a better society. A final area of debate, um, and when we could pick multiple areas, um, but is uh, inflation. And um, Cassie, if you're able to just to go to the next slide, that would be awesome. 
And so inflation is just a general increase in prices. It gets measured through a consumer price index, CPI, which is a table of um, which uh, uh, contains a basket of goods, so a certain um, selection of things in that table. And maybe just to, to jump into this debate about inflation at the moment, um, there's, uh, I think, quite a, a lazy debate in New Zealand at the moment that assumes that inflation is only tied to government spending. Um, and I just want to broaden that out a bit and, and talk about some of the explanations that have come up globally around um, inflation. So I think um, we can split them into demand side explanations and supply side explanations. On the demand side, people have talked in the last couple of years about how quantitative easing, which is essentially when the central bank prints money, but I can talk a bit more about that. But essentially where Q, quantitative easing pushes up the, the price of um, financial assets and creates inflation. And people have talked about government spending creating inflation. Those are two demand side explanations. On the supply side, people have talked about COVID creating increased um, costs for businesses, which lift prices, which is inflation. And people have talked about the role of the Ukraine war. Those are two kind of supply side explanations. I think um, there's a lot to those supply side explanations, and I do also think there's evidence that um, QE, that quantitative easing has contributed to inflation. But one really important explanation that's kind of moved from the fringe to the mainstream is that corporate profits have contributed to inflation. And key to that has been an economist called Isabella Weber, who's in that um, slide there. And her argument is that essentially, um, and she looks at earnings calls, so actually evidence of what companies themselves are saying, her argument is that companies have used these supply shocks as an excuse to lift prices and to lift profit margins and markups, and that that's especially easy when companies have market power. And there's been very little work done on this in New Zealand, um, surprisingly. So actually, the chief economist of the Reserve Bank was asked about this. And at the end of last year, he said, we don't have great data on profits. It's a real blind spot. Um, Ed Miller from First Union um, has done some work on this, and he showed that last year um, corporate profits spiked by 39%, the biggest increase ever seen, and it's something I think we need to talk more about. I'm running out of time, um, so I just want to move briefly um, to um, different ways of thinking about economics for the last few minutes here. Um, and what I'd say here is that um, there are lots of ways to ad um, address this. There are, there are different economic traditions, um, uh, you know, from socialist Marxist economic traditions, um, heterodox economics traditions, um, which, for example, might look at, at the role of behavior. Some people would say kind of Keynesian economic traditions, which come from the work of John Maynard Keynes, are, are alternative. Some people would say they're kind of part of the mainstream. Um, one way of addressing this would be to look at some of those traditions, some of the key thinkers. Um, but in limited time, um, inevitably, I'm going to make value judgments here. And what I wanted to do was just pull out kind of three ideas that could be building blocks for a different way of thinking, perhaps for that kind of alternative agenda, that alternative Aotearoa that Jane was talking about. But again, I want to emphasize that each of these ideas, I'm going to talk about public ownership, universal basic services, um, and industrial policy really briefly. But I want to say that each of these ideas um, has a history. And at different points in time, these ideas have stabilized capitalism. And in the future, they could stabilize capitalism or point to a different way forward uh, moving beyond capitalism. Um, they're just um, some useful ideas, perhaps, um, as we think about building a movement for economics for the people. So just to begin then with um, public ownership, um, many of you will be familiar with this, um, but I think it's important to see it as an economic concept, because it is about how we distribute resources and how we manage resources. And this is just about maintaining services in the state or bringing services into state ownership. So um, Jane talked about the buyback of, of Air New Zealand, nationalization, which is the bringing um, of a service into public ownership. And um, there's lots of, um, uh, one distinction that I think is helpful here is um, talking about sectoral public ownership, which is where an entire sector is brought into public ownership and single entity public ownership, which is where you just have one body that might be publicly owned like Kiwi Bank. Um, I was gonna go through some economic arguments for public ownership, um, like low borrowing costs, um, but I, I am running out of time. Just to say really briefly, um, there are lots of good economic arguments that we can use um, in debates to defend public ownership, including the fact that the state doesn't have to pay dividends to shareholders. The state can achieve economies of scale, which just means things are cheaper when they are bought in bulk. And the state can integrate and coordinate across services. Um, one writer who I think is really helpful on this is David Hall. Um, um, I've got a, a picture of him up there. And I think there's... Um, Lots of interesting ways we could talk about applying this in New Zealand. Um, 
This can be used to defend what we have. For example, there's a current push to privatize um, Auckland Airport by Auckland Council or public shares in Auckland Airport. Um, but this is also the basis potentially for a positive agenda. Um, and so there's been work done on buying back energy companies as a route uh, as part of a green transition. Um, and I also think in New Zealand, we have to think about public ownership differently because of Tiriti or Waitangi. And I think that um, Mati Kemai, as Matt and Jane have already pointed out, um, offers us some really useful ways of thinking about this. If you haven't come across Mati Kemai, I really encourage everyone to read it. It talks about a values-based approach and also an approach grounded in a Kawanatanga sphere or government or crown sphere, a tenoranga teratanga sphere, and a relational sphere where those spheres interact. And the state in New Zealand has a colonial history. And that means that we can't talk simplistically about bringing, say, energy resources into public ownership without thinking in totality consistent terms. And I think that's a challenge for us as we build an economics that's grounded here. Just really briefly, relatedly, a second useful concept, I think, is universal basic services. Um, this is grown in momentum, and this is just on the next slide, if you could jump ahead, please, Cassie. Um, this has grown in momentum, uh, partly as a counter to universal basic income in, in recent years. It first was developed in a, um, a report by economists from University College London in 2017. And the idea is, is really about um, free, expansive public services that are provided universally to a population. Um, and uh, it's about how Moving away from means testing, essentially, means testing public services, because means testing is expensive and stigmatizing, um, and often um, cost barriers we know can disincentivize access to a service. We've seen a little bit of this debate about kind of universal services versus means testing in the, in, since the government scrapped um, prescription charges, one of the good things in, in the budget this year, um, uh, where uh, there have been calls from, from national to go back to, to means testing. Uh, and people have said that um, pharmacists have said actually, you know, having universal access to medicines allows pharmacists to have health based conversations rather than focusing on um, cost. But um, this concept could also apply in other areas like transport. And I put up a, a reference here to a report written last year by New Zealander Jen MacArthur about fares free public transport or universal dental. Um, nodding back to what Nick, Matt said earlier. Um, this is a concept that could, again, be used to, to defend the existing order, to, to stabilize capitalism, but I also think it has the potential to move us beyond it because um, it's potentially a way we decommodify core services. We take services away from being commodities and we shrink the role of markets in our lives and start to build a different kind of order. Lastly, really briefly, um, one idea that um, has gained prominence just in the last few years again is industrial policy. Um, again, this has a kind of different history in different places. I think in the US at the moment, it's having um, a real um, resurgence because the US is worried about China essentially, and it's getting um, involved in industry again. That's what industry policy is. It's about state support for industry for international relations reasons. Um, but I think it is um, an idea that, that um, has real progressive and potentially emancipatory uh, potential. And Jane mentioned economic history being lost. And there are also lots of institutions in New Zealand's past that I think are worth revisiting here, like the Development Finance Corporation, which involved state lending um, tied to exports and regional development. Um, and I did some interviews recently where people said, um, actually, you know, the kiwi fruit, agriculture, wine sectors were all built up through public loans, not through um, the kind of genius of entrepreneurs. Um, and that an active approach um, to building progressive industries um, in ways that are good for workers, um, in ways that might include kind of public stakes in this industries could be part of a different economic future. Um, gone over time, so just in that final slide, I just wanted to um, close by saying um, the key, in my view, as Matt and Jane both said, is not just fine tuning these arguments, because um, we can kind of talk through arguments and counter arguments all we like, but What's key is building power so that in those conversations, we don't feel so much on the back foot, so that we feel confident, so that we know we're not alone. Um, and that's why I think it's really important that um, it's great that everyone's come to this webinar tonight, but we don't just pat ourselves on the back and say, oh, we, we learn some things and then go back to our everyday lives. I think we have to um, include um, these different forms of economic thinking in our campaigns. We have to share ideas that we think are promising with our friends and family, follow things up if we do have time challenge mainstream economic thinking in conversations. And I'd love to see um, a broader series of webinars or sessions on economics for the people um, where we can expand the group of people talking through these ideas and also um, think about a, a way of doing economics and economic policy differently and, and, and talk about also the kinds of metaphors and diagrams and explanations we can use.
um, and how we can harness them to, to change Aotearoa and to change the world. And no reira tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. So you can all see now why we made this two hours, right? <laughs> and we're not even scratching the surface and our dear speakers have, have tuned through so much. Max, honestly, just everything that you've taken us on a journey around is huge. And I'm now starting to wish that I had organized an hour for each of you to talk but that was not the way. And so I love this idea of a series to go back to it. I just have one question for you. Aroha mai iti whanau. I know there's heaps in the questions, okay? But this this is what happens. The, the kōrero's too juicy and there's too many questions. But my one for you is, as is seen in the questions, there's many different possible tax policies that we could make that might improve things you know whether or not it's inheritance tax or corporate tax and you touch on them why aren't we enacting any of these solutions if we can already think them up what's getting in the way of it uh, that's a great question and i'll try to be really short in the answer um one answer is in jane's talk which is that um a lot of work and resources were devoted in the 80s and 90s towards closing down debates and not just closing down debates, but then ensuring that the whole of our public sector and law was designed to support closing down those debates. And I think that has flowed through into tax and it's meant that when tax comes up in debates, um, it's treated as, you know, at best a kind of necessary evil, but still an evil, a burden, a relief, a form of theft. And so um, I do think building a different economic model also uh, has to involve unwinding um, some of those um, really foundational changes in the 80s and 90s um, that, that, that closed down and encased a certain type of economic model, including for tax. Um, I do think that at different points in... Um, the last six years that um, occasionally this government has shown itself to be responsive to popular movements. So where there has been change, though it hasn't been significant enough, say on income support or on prescription charges has come from campaigns. Um, and I do think we've also perhaps lacked campaigns on um, tax, um, specific campaigns about progressive tax and um, uh, with, with different options. And I think we don't have the progressive think tanks um, and left-wing think tanks um, to back up a kind of uh, shift in ideas yet. And um, I think, uh, yeah, we need to kind of take on those campaigns, take on that kind of surrounding architecture, but that just um, touches the surface. Thank you, Max. This has been awesome. So two things from here. The first thing is that obviously we have so many amazing questions and I'm going to try and roll them all into one mega question um <laughs> and we'll be here another two hours now um what I'm got what I really want to know and what is coming through is wait I'll find it I'll find it it's in here what is the alternative to neoliberal capitalism <laughs> the trillion dollar question and how do we organize around this alternative and create collectivism that is needed for an alternative system, okay? So the question is, is where to from the future? I really want to know from you, um, what, what's your fave alternative? What is an idea that really gives you hope and inspiration that we can move towards? And how can we generate more activism around it? So have a think about that. And while you're thinking about how you're going to answer that question and any closing comments, I'm going to um, give a brief interlude and, and use this moment to step onto my action station soapbox because um, why not take the opportunity while you're all here. Now, just like our name, we at Action Station believe we can't just talk about the problem. We also need to take action and do something about it. So I'm pretty excited because we can officially announce that we are launching a campaign on this issue or close to this issue, and we want to call on the government to increase the tax on corporate profits. 
Now, we think that it's time to rebalance the scales of our economy and fund the public services we all need to thrive, like Max touched on. And we can do this by calling on our major corporations who are making huge profits, like Jane touched on, during this cost of living crisis and put that wealth back into the people. So the petition has literally just been set up. If you want to be one of the first people to sign it, please click on the link that my dear um, colleague Anne will chuck in the chat box. Um, by signing up, it will bring you into the engine room of the campaign so we can take action together and especially in the lead up to the election. And you will probably get an email from Cassie-Action Station around 8 a.m. tomorrow morning, giving you a little bit more information. So here's a heads up. Now, the great thing is, is we aren't the only ones calling on tax solutions in our economic crisis. So Tax Justice Aotearoa brought together a fair tax campaign coalition this year with over 17 organisations who all believe the time is now to take action on tax. They're calling on the government to be transparent about tax, to raise more revenue, to enable us to address the challenges we face, make sure that the people who have more to contribute make that contribution, to make greater use of fair taxes to promote health and environmental needs and to address the tax impact on the least well-off in society. I really don't think that our political parties are going to get serious about changing our economy or redistributing our wealth or putting more funding back into public services unless we see mass public support for a fairer tax system. But they just won't take action. So I really invite you all if you agree with this ask around increasing corporate tax in some way, please join us and get involved this year. Now, over to our last words from our kai kōrero. Keep in mind, I'm I'm sorry, it's only a handful of minutes. We're trying to wrap it up at eight. Um, and I'm going to go over in the same order to Matt. Any thoughts on the final question? Um, yeah, I mean, it's a huge question, right? um and i'm sorry and there's, it's all right there's always there's always risks of trying to envision a whole new world um or a whole new system right so i i i i like to think practically what is some what where do i see a potential lever or as the the words we use within Ngaitahu uh gray space What's a grey space that isn't um, being inhabited at the moment that we might be able to explore and poke around in? So I, I, I said very clearly, I see Māori economies. Um, and that's, as Jane pointed out, there's, there's a diversity within Māori economies, right? We do have capitalist organisations. Uh, one thing that remains yet to be seen, but I do think we're seeing it, is, is whether um, Māori, particularly uh, the post-settlement governance entities, um, are using corporate power to build political power. And what they do with that political power is interesting to me. So you think of um, the initial, original role of iwi was defending the realm. Iwi didn't often do economic production, right? That was at Fano and hapu levels, but they came together to defend the realm. So if we think of defending the realm in the contemporary context, that could be considered, um, you know, uh, rangatiratanga over water, for example, which is, is a claim that Ngaitahu has uh, at the moment to um, assert rangatiratanga over water for the good of the water, right? Um, and and so I see that uh, I I don't know what this 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 new vision beyond neo neoliberal capitalism looks like, but I see that as a potential lever of change is, is advancing tinoranga tiratanga um, that takes economic change seriously, um, and whether or not it pans out that way is remains to be seen, but it's something that I can um, maybe be involved with. Uh, on the ground. Love it. Jane, over to you. Yoda, my cat's come home. Um, in, in the Fire Economy book, um, which I just went to get to remind myself, um, there was... Um, a final chapter called Transformation. 
uh, just as there was in the New Zealand experiment when I wrote about how to counter the, the neoliberal era. Um, and I think we need to have coherent approaches but I just, uh, rather than delving into those, I'd like to build on on what Matt was talking about, um, about the need to avoid kind of the episodic campaigns that we've had. Um, and I speak in particular in the context of the trade agreements. Um, so that we had a massive campaign to oppose the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, TPPA. Uh, hugely successful, um, but it's died off. Right? And I think now if we tried to do that kind of campaign, we would have all sorts of conspiracy theories and rabbit holes, and it would be really difficult to, to do a similar kind of campaign. But one of the things that has happened out of the Waitangi Tribunal claim on the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement was the setting up of an entity Ngā Toki Whakarururanga, which has as its role a treaty-based approach to international, um, the, the broad international trade policy space, uh, which is not just about commercial trade, but it's talking about, if you're talking about that form of trade, it's talking about a relationship trade, the kind of whakawhanaunga trade that, um, um, that was discussed um, much earlier on. Um, but it's also reaching out to all of the communities that are affected by those agreements. And so that includes waka kaiora and the organics and anti-GMOs, it includes rongoa, it includes the creatives, it includes the digital, um, amongst many others, um, the health, the waiora and, and so on. Um, and so it, it's trying to connect up communities that have a common um, interest that they don't actually know about yet. Um, so those communities don't know about the impact of, of trade and investment agreements on them, even though they impact on them. Um, and so there is now this strategy being developed to go out to those communities to do education and empowerment work so they can have voice um, to be able to um, put pressure on to change the model, the paradigm of the kind of international trade and investment agreements that has been stuck in the um, exploitive space um, right from the colonial era that Matt was talking about through to the, the contemporary um, embedded neoliberalism I was talking about. So that's just an example of, of trying to find ways to develop an empowerment model that um, doesn't mean we all have to be out there with placards on the street, but it means um, strengthening those who are there to work with others to have voice and power to exercise rangatiratanga, to exercise um, kaitiakitanga, to, to work um, with um, tauiwi who also are committed to that kind of, of transformation. So that's a, a practical thing happening now about trying to work out how to do this. Thank you, Jane. That's really helpful because it's telling us that it's not just about what's in the future, it's what's already happening now. So kia ora for that. And over to you, Max. Any final words on your dream alternative? That's um, such a hard question, like Matt said, um, but uh, yeah, I think an alternative to neoliberalism involves like a, a, a transfer of, of, a massive transfer of power and wealth to, to marginalised and working people in a totality consistent way um, and in a way that remains internationally connected. And you could put lots of labels on that um, and also in a way that kind of embodies values of um, of justice and solidarity and care and community. Um, 
yeah you could call it call it socialism call it um what you like but i think um i think yeah focusing on this place and our history focusing on power um and and remaining connected internationally is important to me as part of that alternative um and then kind of building on what jane said i think yeah one way to that is through thinking about um yeah what are the what are the reforms that add up to a kind of different society and um yeah i think campaigns like universal dental um are important because they yeah open up conversations about universalism about why some things might be too important to be left to the market um but i think i saw a couple of questions about you know like okay how can we implement this which is totally fair and i'm a, uh, i work in campaigns and i um have the sort of same feeling but this is why like understanding is really important i think is because we can start to join together these issues and say um, okay, this is a movement against privatizing Auckland Airport, but also underpinning this is um, opposition to asset sales. And that means we can move quickly next time that comes up. Or this is a movement for universal dental, but we understand why universal services are important and some things need to be taken out of the market. And we can see how that applies to transport or energy. Um, and that's why that kind of foundational understanding, I think, is, is so crucial to, um, to weave through our movements if we can. Ora tātou, ngā mihi nunui ki a koutou ki ngā kai kōrero i tia nei pō. Thank you, thank you, thank you to our speakers tonight. My brain is shooting off in a million directions, all good ones. And more than anything, I feel very reinvigorated around our economic system. I know from my experience, I've often felt like... um a little bit lonely at times thinking about these things and wondering who else is talking about it where are these conversations happening aside from at our dinner tables often the time how are we coming together and learning more and talking more about what the change might be so ultimately we can take action to change it because what I heard from Max was that we can't think of our economy as some natural system that just has its own laws of physics and we can never challenge it actually it's really about we write the rules the people can write the rules and should write the rules in terms of how our economy works and how we make it work for us and our planet it's all possible and so I'm feeling very excited thank you thank you everyone for showing up um, thank you for the amazing questions I'm sorry we couldn't get them to them all but there will be time to talk about this, I know. And um, we'll let you know if we have a recording up. We'll check in about, the, about it afterwards at our debrief. And finally, just a closing karakia to send you back off into the world, hopefully a bit refreshed and racked up for changing this economy for the better. Unuhia, unuhia, unuhia ki te uru tapunui, kia wātia, kia māma, te ngāko, te tinana, te wairua i te aratakata. Koia rā e rongo whakiri a ki ki runga. Tuturu whakamaua ki a tīna, tīna. Haumi e hui e, tāi ki e. Tā ki te everyone. Have a great night. Thanks to the interpreters.